Uh, for our first talk after lunch, uh, we have a talk uh, by Allison Parker and Alice, Alex Long about how Open Harbor supported the COVID-19 response and the lessons learned from uh, public policy. And so just as a reference, I believe Alex is calling in because he has a little bit of a temperamental uh, network connection, but otherwise it should be a normal talk. So I'll turn it over to them and they can talk about everything they've been doing to improve people's lives during the pandemic. Hello, Alex, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will begin um, our talk today. And thank you so much for having us. I know we're both really excited for this talk um, about truly um, such, such an important topic. So first, we're going to be starting on um, what the Wilson Center is um and why we got here so our talk today is going to be on how open hardware supported the COVID-19 response and the lessons that we have learned by hosting a round table with leaders um, who are kind of on the front lines of this response so as the wilson center we are a nonpartisan uh foreign policy think tank chartered by congress to cover a lot of different regional areas um, but one thing that we have um, are these cross-cutting issues um, and the science and technology innovation program of which Allison and I are both party to uh, tackles issues in emerging tech um, and science on a globally relevant scale. And we have done a lot of work in the open science world and through citizen science and data standardization. And only about two years ago did we start to tackle open source hardware which leads us to our talk today about the Think Tank Initiative. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. I'm hearing things twice, so I'm not sure what um, is real and what is fake. <laughs> Um, Can you click forward? Yes. I think you're good to go. Okay, really sorry, really sorry about that. Um, so yeah, as Alex mentioned, I'm I'm Allison Parker, um, and uh, we'll be talking to you today from the Wilson Center and discussing an initiative that has come out of um, an initiative we've been working on over the last. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm hearing. Um, I'm hearing things in my ears, so it's really hard to speak over that. Um, so today, Alex and I are going to be discussing an initiative that we've been working on through the Thing Tank, which is a uh, work we've been doing over the last year um, related to low cost and open tools for science. Um, we are going to build on the COVID theme that we've discussed already uh, so far and go into a bit more detail into one of the reports that Michael mentioned at the beginning of today's event. Um, and following up, I think a really um, great introduction to this space from um, Megan McCarthy, um, really building on some of the ideas that she brought up at the outset. Um, and we aim to provide a bit of an overview of this uh, roundtable uh, work that we've worked on and um, will get into some of the conclusions, um, but obviously we'll point you back to the publication for some more detail. And 
we're really excited to talk about a lot of these ideas and would love to hear from any of you uh, later um, on any of these aspects that we're interested in. So go ahead, Alex. All right, so I wanna start us off with um, where we started and that was February 7th for me was when Dr. Tedros, the deputy um, general of the WHO declared that there was going to be a massive PPE shortage across the world. And while that, again, February for the US at least, that was not a huge issue at the time. COVID-19 was not on the front page, so to speak. But obviously as time progressed and we got into March, um, these shortages started to really hit um, A1 or the front page. And that's why I've chosen these different um, headlines to kind of communicate that point where we saw this media swell of activism around um, these issues. And in parallel, we were able to see different online groups also forming. And these online groups had Twitters and they had Facebooks and they were um, all these different organizations, both on the local scale and the global scale, very popular um, with the use of hashtag get us or get me PPE. Um, this led us to then reaching out uh, to one of our friends in our networks, Michael Weinberg and the Engelberg um, Center at NYU and form this inner network within our own um, specialties. This allowed us to kind of create a round table uh, with leaders from notable organizations, some of which have already talked today at Helpful Engineering, Luminary Labs, Open Source Medical Supplies, the Department of Homeland Security, Make for COVID, the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, Nation of Makers, the NIH, We the Builders, Universal, University Hospital Ventures, the National Science Foundation, and America Makes. So it was this really awesome uh, group of leaders that we then conducted little interviews with to then prepare us for a round table um, which was hosted back in October. That round table then became a publication, um, which we'll be talking about today. Okay. Apologies again. I'm trying to talk over what I'm hearing from. <laughs> um, okay, so thanks, Alex, for that great introduction of this initiative. Um, I think I'll start here by describing some of the bigger picture conclusions from the roundtable, um, a lot of which will not come as any surprise to you all. Um, namely, the, our biggest conclusion after um, this work is that open hardware is in many ways very well suited for this kind of situation. Um, and that's for many reasons, again, which will be no surprise to you all. Um, open hardware is often produced at a much lower price point and more broadly available. Um, having a lot of individuals with diverse expertise working on one problem versus open sharing and editing um, of design files will accelerate innovation. Um, through the use of digital fabrication tools and those being available in various places around the country, um, individuals can adapt and customize their production to meet local needs. Uh, the modular nature of open source hardware allows for efficient collaboration, especially because various pieces and components can be um, built together and pulled together um, in a distributed and diverse way. So throughout this report, we, yeah, we really found that the power and effectiveness that these communities can demonstrate during COVID-19 really probably very much underrepresents their, their potential. Um, another major conclusion from the report, which was uh, indicated earlier in, in both Megan's talk and then Michael mentioned this early on, was that the response was really significantly less effective than it could have been with more intentional coordination in particular from the federal government. And of course that's with very comm commendable exceptions, um, one of which being Megan's work with the NIH 3D Print Exchange and the 3D COVID Trust. Um, but really 
um, we came to the conclusion that with more intentional coordination between open source hardware communities and government authorities, um, there could be uh, a much higher impact. And that's something that we should look towards for the future. Um, so beyond the direct impact of this work um, that we looked at, <clears throat> we think that this, re this response also serves as a case study for understanding how open source hardware communities can interface with public policy, with regulations, um, with government authorities, and sort of all of the challenges that go into doing so. So I think we'll take a few minutes to go into in more into depth on a few of the observations we made during this um, initiative, and then we will bring it back to the big picture and um, talk about some of the recommendations we have um, for the various stakeholders. Yes, so I'm gonna start talking just a little bit about the community coordination that we found so interesting um, because like this quote says, um, it was ad hoc both within government agencies and then also on the grassroots level, which is not necessarily something that is intuitive or expected, especially on the government level, but for those probably much of the audience who understands the open science and the open innovation space, um, even in government, these things are done on an informal basis and this time was really no different. So um, to dive further into the community coordination aspect, we saw a bunch of coordinating organizations and large networks like open source medical supply, um, for example, being able to uh, call on different communities that were once disparate, maybe focusing on the arts or focusing on scientific education or focusing on environmental justice and health and bringing them all together. Um, in the open source medical supply context, I know they brought together the nation makers, the Fab Foundation, Maker Fair, and it was um, this network approach um, and creating power in numbers. But of course, I really want to mention that there is an equity aspect to this, um, which can, which should be addressed in future iterations of open source hardware practices, where because it was done on such a network and personal connections basis, that meant that um, only certain people within connections to um, people who understood regulations in medicine, lawyers, business people, finance people, those were the ones who were able to uh, be successful, which makes sense, but of course leaves a barrier to entry for some organizations that were smaller and unable to kind of navigate those hurdles with personal expertise and personal networks. That was obviously a strength for some and also shows just the ingenuity that a you know community can bring when you bring together a bunch of different expertise, which is kind of what happened with the government approach too, which I'm sure you've heard about today, and how a lot of um, the same conversations that were happening with these informal personal networks at the grassroots level were also happening um, within the federal government where different people with different expertise and different agencies were able to get together on these skunk works um, groups, uh, which is a new word to me, but I do love it, um, to basically put their heads together in this informal capacity and try to at least usher in open source practices to potentially patch um, the holes within the supply chain PPE, the PPE supply chain that we all saw uh, back in March, April, May, and honestly ongoing. Um, so yeah. Great. Um, I will spend a, just a few minutes talking about a, another one of our broader recommendation or another broader observation we made throughout this process, which is related to um, regulatory challenges, uh, which will be, again, no surprise to you all. And Megan really <clears throat> uh, hinted at this uh, during her presentation earlier. Um, and she talked about a sort of gray area in standards, which I think is a great way of describing what was going on with open source hardware communities who were willing and able you know, to manufacture a wide range of necessary equipment and supplies, um, but faced um, standards and regulations that were not set up for them. They were set up for an entirely different system. And so often these, uh, the open source hardware communities would need to navigate a prioritization between moving very quickly on the one hand, and on the other hand, taking a, a more conservative approach to regulatory compliance. 
So again, there's so much more to be said about this and we could, we could get into this um, for much longer, but a few of the strategies taken by open source hardware communities included things like developing their own safety and regulatory guidelines and procedures. Um, they included complying with the spirit of regulations when it was not possible to comply fully or get the full approval process for um, regulatory approval uh, under what would normally be the case in a different kind of situation. Um, there was often a level of informal assessment by medical and legal experts, um, a lot of times coming from that network um, that Alex mentioned. And then finally, and this happened sort of more and more throughout the whole process, umbrella organizations and intermedi intermediaries really stepped in to um, begin to, to identify common standards and protocols that um, the entire uh, movement could really take advantage of. Um, I'll mention briefly some recommendations that, that we would like to make um, following this uh, broad look at what happened during um, this response to COVID-19. And they come in these three categories mainly. And the first being that uh, the federal government really should support grassroots open source hardware communities as much as possible. And this could mean a variety of different things. It could include platforms to enable virtual communication, which was a major piece of this. It could include um, just general support for the development of communities, which would go a long way. Um, and then finally thinking broadly about the, the demand signal. So trying to come up with systems for which um, there can be much more communication between those that needed um, PPE or medical supplies and those that were able and in a position to provide them, namely these grassroots open source hardware communities. Um, so, you know, Megan talked about this too, but creating this network before a crisis would allow for these lines of communication to really be much more effective when, um, when there's much more urgency uh, in how, how everything plays out. Um, another piece of this is to, to think about also within the federal government and, and to support those formal and also ad hoc communities of federal practitioners who can understand and value open source hardware approaches and, and work to integrate those into um, everything that's going on. Um, other recommendations include um, really developing the infrastructure for um, how to implement and you know bring in open source hardware approaches into the broader landscape, including regulators and others evaluating when contributions from non-traditional designers and creators are likely to be important, safe, and necessary, et cetera. Um, and then finally, related to standards and regulations, I think the onus is again on the regulators and um, other federal parties to identify opportunities for communities themselves to create the infrastructure needed, things like community evaluation and peer review, um, things like the NIH 3D print exchange, um, and in general, work to translate those formal standards and benchmarks um, and testing to um, allow them to be used in, in non-standard settings. So I'll mention briefly, or uh, never mind, Alex, over to you. And then after that, I'll mention briefly another project. Yeah, so I think that um, to sum up what we've said, uh, right now is an inflection point, and that can be seen through the day one project proposals um, that are currently being circulated and we're already posted up day one being um, some science and technology policy proposals for day one of the Biden administration and three tackle certain open source hardware practices and it's working into um, federal infrastructure and then also future policy, which is super exciting. And that only adds to the executive orders um, that the Biden administration has already put out on supply chain um, on the public health side and then also supply chain just in general. And that is to create a faster response in crises, both of the biological manner, like in a pandemic, but then also generally other, um, other issues and other issues in the supply chain uh, moving forward. So it does feel like right now is open source hardware's time to 
broaden the perspectives of the federal government through these executive orders and future actions um, that they could potentially be worked into. So all of this builds into these broader questions um, that we're interested in tackling both through this initiative and through broader ones. And again, would love to engage with any of you on these, these kinds of questions. Thinking about how the response to COVID-19 shortages demonstrates strengths and limitations of open source hardware and associated communities, how communities organize to achieve impact and move from informal to formal structures, and how do open source hardware communities and other grassroots communities interact with existing legal and regulatory frameworks? And I'll just mention very briefly, because I know we're out of time, um, that many of these um, questions and others are also uh, explored in this policy brief, which actually um, is newly available today, which um, we at the Wilson Center worked on with co-authors, Shannon Doe's Megan and Jenny Malloy. Um, and this policy brief really makes the case for public policy audiences as to uh, sort of why open hardware works and why we need to think differently about how the US invests in tools for science. Um, and this policy brief builds on um, a series of articles and a workshop that we hosted last fall with 22 experts. I think many of you are here today um, from open hardware and open science communities where we work together to outline uh, key messages for public policy audiences and uh, really delved into those through these um, articles on Medium through the Journal of Open Hardware. Um, so I encourage you all to, to check that out. Um, and again, get in touch with us if you're interested in these issues and we'll broadly be thinking about how, how we communicate about open hardware to public policy audiences um, and sort of follow up on some of these really big questions related to both COVID and the broader landscape of science. <laughs>